Hello and welcome to my channel. This is Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud. And this is a little blue book. As you can see, it says there at the top, Little Blue Book. This one happens to be number 372, Problems of Birth Control and Herbal Population, A Guide to Mafianism. Written by John S. Gams. This is part four. And we are about to pick up where we left off here in a minute. On page 36. Nope, nope. It's going to be 37. The Plum Plan. Well, perhaps, but the world is so full of a number of plans. Let me reread that. I think our last sentence that we left off with, with was, How can it be abated? The Plum Plan? That's better. Well, perhaps, but the world is so full of a number of plans. The most apparent justification, philosophically, for laissez-faire, was to be found in the doctrine of natural rights. This doctrine was dear to the rising industrial classes. In America, it formed that part of the Declaration of Independence, which is taught to all schoolboys and girls. In France, it was embodied in the Declaration des Droits de Vahomme et du Citoyen. I just butcher French. To the manufacturers who substituted a government based on the possession of machine, machinery for a, government, for a government based on the possession of land, the doctrine of natural rights was interpreted to mean that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, such as trading where and when one can, charging as much for bread as the traffic will bear, manipulating markets, underpaying workers, and other priceless rights. Laissez-faire, as the thorough-going uniform economic policy, was abandoned as soon as manufacturers saw that it would be wiser to have government on one side than to spurn the help that government can give. Besides, in the latter half of the 19th century, manufacturers themselves began to see the harmful results economically of unregulated child labor and long hours for women. Militarists saw that a stunted factory population makes but indifferent cannon fodder. It has also been said that the laissez-faire was abandoned in part because the world has become more humanitarian. Perhaps there are some people who can review the last decade in Europe and still cling to a belief that the ideals of the world have improved during the last century, but there are many who cannot. As for the relation of Malthus to laissez-faire, that should be obvious. He held that certain checks had been sent someone, by a divine power perhaps, to prevent the population from increasing disproportionately to the food supply. Any radical interference with the benevolent checks, any great alleviation of poverty, any substantial aid rendered to the helpless, was wrong, let alone if workers spend all their money foolishly buying food, let them starve. Let alone, if women and children insist on working 16 hours daily, why, let them. Above all else, laissez-faire. The preceding paragraph has hinted that closely associated with laissez-faire was an early view of economic laws as laws of nature, or what was the same divine laws, perhaps, the reader has noted in quotations that Matthias seemed to think his law, like the law of gravity, inexorable. The physiocrats who held doctrines of natural law claimed that these laws worked out for the general good in the end, and that men should study these laws and conform to nature, for only so will happiness and prosperity prevail. 
Mr. Veblen has pointed out that these natural economic laws were not, like the law of gravity, assumed to be entirely unexceptionable. They were, rather, a gradual unfoldment of nature's plan. And continues Mr. Veblen, nature did not feel uneasy if from perverseness or neglect men put obstacles in the way of this of the this gradual unfoldment. The law sooner or later would come into its own. By an easy step we can now proceed to a discussion of the word tendency. For tendency is a term which has often been used in economics to denote the gradual manifestation of a natural economic law. Interpreted, it may be, by what Mr. Veblen, with his unusual humor, calls an oversight on the part of businessmen. For example, when Malthus says that population has a constant tendency to increase beyond the means of, of substance, he has said nothing. As I write, my hand has a tendency in traveling the page, to move now to the south pole, now to the north, and as it descends the page, it has a tendency to go to Europe. Nevertheless, I feel quite safe that my hand will remain in the land of the free and the home of the brave as long as I do. In economics, the word tendency has been invoked to give currency to theories which economists would wish to be true and which are but half-truths. The use of the word should be investigated by a psychoanalyst rather than by me. He would find that the economist in trying to prove a pet a priori theory would be at a loss to discover confirmatory evidence for this theory but the economist is unwilling to relinquish his theory entirely on account of such a trifling matter as a disagreement with ordinary everyday facts. He therefore substitutes the word tendency for the more positive expression which he would like to use. It is probably not going too far to say that Malthus would have been very pleased to say population is increasing beyond the means of substance. The word is seems definite, tangible. It strikes terror. It harrows up the soul. But the only trouble is it's not true. And Mr. Malthus, being dignified and having a professional reputation to maintain, would not dare state an obvious falsehood. It was necessary for him, therefore, to couch the theory, dear to his heart, in vulgar terms. Population tends to increase beyond the means of substance. This sounds moderate, thoughtful, scholarly, and means nothing. Among one of the most common tendency fallacies is the law of supply and demand. The relation of supply to demand, we say, tends to regulate prices, and such a statement we call, in all seriousness, a law. What does it mean? It means only that if no other forces were operating, a condition which, like absolute vacuity, challenges the imagination, the law of supply and demand would operate. Books on economics fairly bristle with tendencies and in the long runs. It is said, for example, that in the long run, the introduction of labor-saving machinery here tends to be compensated for by a greater need for labor elsewhere. Very good, let us assume, but the discharged worker tends to spend all of his savings before finding that job elsewhere, and in the long run, he may form part of the breadline. I have said that the word tendency has been used by economics, economists to mitigate a statement which they wished would be true in a more positive manner. Such an assertion may be objected to as extreme, and no doubt there are times when the word tendency is the only proper word to use. Nevertheless, disregarding what has preceded, it remains true that econo economists have habitually enunciated theories which please them, or, what is more to the point, their patrons, the wealthy. 
Malthus has been shown did this. His theories delighted the privileged classes because they showed that the present order of things was natural and unchangeable. But it must not be supported. But it must not be supposed that Malthus lay awake nights cynically concocting arguments which would please the owners of property. Far from it. Psychologists have lately given a name to a mental process which has long been recognized as children, we used to call it, making excuses. In baseball and boxing, slangy reporters call it making an alibi. But psychologists call it rationalization. So much has lately been written on this subject that I hesitate to describe the process at all fully. To the, rent, to the reader who feels that I am speaking of the too obvious, I recommend skipping a few paragraphs. There will be no more pearls for a while, only a discussion on rationalization. Well, rationalization is the last infirmity of noble minds. Even the men who invented the word rationalize, we all do, if, for example, we are asked to tell why we love certain members of the opposite sex, we soar to ever greater heights of self-justification. Because her heart is pure, we say, or he is kind, tender, and loves dogs and children, or she Come on, page. Or she has a noble character. Or he is intelligent, just, and honest. Or some other absurdity. The, face, the fact is we fall in love perhaps because there was nobody else with whom we could conveniently fall in love. Pro, propoquity, propoquity rather than honesty, accessibility rather than kindness is probably the basis of the love. Now, the record doth not state how economists have rationalized in respect of their loves, but it has left in black and white their rationalizations on economics. The essence of rationalization is to justify what exists. Someone has called it ex post facto justification. The most difficult economic fact to justify, ex explain, or explain away is the uneven distribution of wealth. If a critical examination were made of all the books on economics which have been written since earliest times, it would probably be, probably be found that distinguished in some way or, or other, a majority of the works justify the uneven distribution of wealth or explain the reasons for it or explain them away. Some of the theories are now discredited, e.g. the divine right of kings. Others are obsolete obsolescent, but most of them are hale and hearty, albeit somewhat wrinkled and worn by age. Malthus inject new life into the defenses of the unequal distribution of wealth. He shed another light, and an unexpected one, on the situation. He did not even have to explain why or how the present system of distribution had come about, for, he argues, if you don't like this system of distribution, try another any other. To the very same degree that you succeed in housing, feeding, and sheltering everyone comfortably, to that same degree will you hasten the inevitable hour in which population will exceed the food supply. It is not a question of whether the present system be just, it is a question of whether any other system be possible. This gave a new kink to the string of theories justifying the economic system of that day. Economists abandoned their wrinkled, though healthy and well-wearing well old mistresses, law of diminishing return, wages of abstinence, Eve ate the apple. They flocked at the feet of the newly discovered virgin, the principle of population. Here was rationalization or ex post facto justification in her most alluring shape. I wish again to emphasize that my task is not to prove that Matthias picked out every fruitless or reactionary movement of his age and supported it. He was merely in the grip of contemporary movements. 
just as we are in the grip of the theory of evolution and all its implications, or in the grip of psychoanalysis. I shall now discuss these theories held by Matthias, which can be construed as beneficial to society. If free trade be looked upon as socially beneficial, then Matthias may be credited with having espoused a good cause. In his discussion of the Corn Laws, Book 3, Chapter 4 and 5, he considers bounties on exhortation harmful, as well as the restriction of, of importation. He says, A perfect freedom of trade, therefore, is a vision which it is to be feared can never be realized. But still, it should be our object to make as near approaches to it as we can. It should always be considered as the greatest general rule, and when any deviations from it are proposed, those who propose them are bound clearly to make out the exception. But still, it should be our object to make as near approaches to it as we can. It should always be considered as the greatest general rule, and when any... Okay. To make out the exception, it has been stated when the relation of natural rights to laissez-faire was under discussion that complete individualism, freedoms of competition, was the ideal of the age. The carrying out of such an ideal consistently demanded that there be freedom of trade. During the life of Malthus, Huskisson, Huskisson, and Robert Peel seriously took up the work of removing import and export duties. In 1845, duties were removed from over 400 articles, but the most serious struggle in the free trade movement was a struggle for the repeal of the Corn Laws, a struggle in which Malthus aligned himself on the side of the repeal. The Corn Law of 1815 had forbidden the importation of wheat so long as the prevailing price did not exceed 10 shillings a bushel. If free importation could be secured, the price of wheat would fall, due to a larger supply. Laborers could live more cheaply, wages could be forced to a new and lower level. Manufacturers, therefore, and their academic henchmen like Malthus favored repeal. In 1849, a law was passed by which the protective tariff on wheat was to cease, but a slight duty was still to be collected. It is quite possible from my frequent mention of the laissez-faire and from my associating this policy with the physiocrats that the reader may be gain, may, the reader has gained the impression that Malthus was one of the physiocrats. This is not so. He was merely influenced by physiocratic speculation which chronologically preceded him. Malthus with Ricardo was one of the leaders of what is known as the classical school. But any school is merely a link between the preceding and the succeeding schools. Thus the classical economists gleaned many of their ideas from those who preceded them, and they carried the seeds of these movements which bore fruit when cultivated by their successors. Among, among such movements, one of the most beneficial was the introduction of statistics and economics. Credit is usually given to Javons for this innovation, but Javons would not have been able to do anything if the earth had not been broken by his predecessors. Malthus was a predecessor. He was a good mathematician. He had, after a fashion, adduced statistical data in his principal population and he was one of the earliest fellows of the Statistical Society founded in 1834. The importance of, statist of statistics to economics and to the social and biological sciences cannot be overestimated. If one will pick up a good book on nearly any phase of economics, it will be found that the argument is based on many tables, a large number of which are perhaps reproduced. Without numbers, the modern economist is helpless. And this is the splendid thing, for it means that today economic science is inducive, inductive, not based on a prior theories, which, like math, Methuselah, Methuselahism, 
I want to call it Methus Meth Methuenism, is full of sound and fury, but signifly signifies nothing. And I think we'll stop there, as I'm having trouble saying the words anymore.